The question that I'm asked most about looking into the face of George Mallory is, what was it like? Did you take a picture? Amazing, right? I'm the only person alive to have ever looked into the face of George Lee Mallory. It's an amazing experience and I still can't believe it. It's an experience that I don't take lightly, but if you'll indulge me, I'd like to take some time to speak with my climbing partner that day, Andy Politz, who was with me at the site. But first, if you want to always have the inside scoop on the mystery of Mallory and Irvin and any stories related to it, be sure that you click subscribe and you comment and like on this video. Tell me how you feel about it. Did you do it? I hope you did. And for my members at 99 cents a month, I occasionally send out emails and newsletters with special inside information that only members can see. Think about it. Click the button that says join below this video. After the discovery of George Mallory at nearly 27,000 feet or 8,200 meters on the 1st of May, 1999, we all descended back down to base camp for an extended rest and a huge party to celebrate the discovery. We rested and then soon we made a plan and that was to go back up on or about May 12th where we would take some time, two of us would look for Sandy Irvin and the other four would go on to the second step and try for the summit. We departed for Camp 5 and we immediately realized there was way too much snow to do a new search for Sandy Irvin, so the decision was made for two of us to return to the site of George Mallory when the other four would head up to the second step and toward the summit. As it would turn out, a gigantic Himalayan storm comes in, pinning us down for three days in the death zone. It was almost impossible just to stand up outside of your tent. So we waited and we knew if the storm went a little bit too long, we'd have to descend and end the expedition. On May 16th, the day dawned absolutely brilliant, clear, uh, not a breath of wind in the air. So the six of us went up to Camp 6. Andy Politz and I dropped an oxygen bottle, a rope, and some other equipment for the summit team. And then from there, we descended down to the site where George Lee Mallory lay. Not unlike on the day of the discovery, when Andy and I went to visit the site of George Lee Mallory on May 16th, we revealed new clues of the fate of Mallory and Irvin, among them the discovery of the watch. Here's Andy Politz from his home in Washington State. On May 16th, the dawn of that day, it was brilliantly beautiful. We all went up to Camp 6. You and I dropped an oxygen, full oxygen bottle, a rope, some gear. And at high camp, you put the batteries in the metal detector and we went down to the Mallory site by going way out west from camp six, not that far, and zigzagging down. And if you could pick it up from there, I remember you looking at me going, well, I'll be damned. I can't find George Mallory. You, I don't know if you're- well, that would be, that's, that's pretty much in keeping with my typical navigation skills <laughs> being lost. And he's a boat builder uh, people <laughs> uh, you know my goal was to go up there ha are we sure the camera hadn't just fallen out yes and so the idea with metal detector was to sweep the area mm -hmm. sweep up high down in did it look i walked down from where i was searching when we found him that day i walked straight down to george mallory um, I don't know if I deviated more than 50 feet. Mm. And so I, I walked down his fall line. He fell out of, and I'm pretty sure he fell out of this gully I was going up into. Mm. And, uh, you know, I may have fallen out of it too, if Conrad hadn't called and turned me around and mm. with, when he discovered Mallory. So 27,000 feet approximately, would you say? And I'll Below the yellow goes. band, yeah, uh -huh. in a steep gully. It was real slabby rock. Would have been very difficult to down climb. Mm. Yeah, I probably would have fallen out of it too. But how Mallory fell, that's a whole nother discussion. So, yeah, I mean, it was your first trip to George Mallory. And, uh, you know, mm. I wanted to just allow you the full impact of that. Um, cause that's something that's a life experience. Yeah. We had, 
the metal detector with us. So we were able to do more searching. Um, I, you worked the metal detector and I essentially looked under George Mallory. And that's when I found the watch. I remember there was a, he had a, like a leather helmet on and he had a clasp underneath it. And I kind of tried to undo it and I couldn't do it. And I decided to leave that. Why would I do that? Now thinking and having seen the trauma over his left eye, I wonder if maybe there was damage to his skull that we did not see by leaving the leather cap on him. But um, in having gone there twice, you being the only person to have done that, what is your belief of to how far they made it? Do you think they made it? Was it possible? And do, have you ever worked out a scenario in your mind of what might have happened? I think anybody who had been through some of these World War I battles or been through war, period, that's not like normal experience, not even a little bit. And to think, to judge these people's capacity against our normal stresses, Hmm. their capacity is stretched so much from that experience hmm. Hmm. it's not the same even close so well could they have made it oh, of course you know this last trip uh i ended up taking my oxygen mask off for the last hour or so just for fun <laughs> And uh, Just to it, see it, what was, it was slower. I don't even know if it's a whole lot slower, but could they have made it? Now, this is 2021, and this is not like Andy's doing his little experiment with George Mallory. Mm -hmm. It's just life as we get to it. And so looking back at that, it's like, well, it's similar to Mallory. Um, they started out with oxygen, it sure looks like. And they ended up without somewhere in between. Well, pretty doable. You know, it's a hard day. Could they have done it? Sure. Um, could they have climbed the second step? Well, they didn't have to do it in pure technique could george mallory have stood on andrew irvine's shoulder and reached the hand jam of hand jams you couldn't have fallen out if both your legs popped off you that hand jam was so good that it's so natural i don't think there's any trouble with them having climbed the second step with a handstand a shoulder stand Probably not with a handstand, but, you know, even going from a shoulder to an upraised arm, all those were techniques that were being done once in a while in, at the time. And then it's just a matter of finishing off that long ridge to the top. And I'm sure that's a hard day, but they do. I think they know. Yeah, they know. Mallory was a student of the classics in school you know, in school and would know the value of your team winning the national football championship. Everybody in town suddenly stands a little taller, is willing to take a little more risk, willing to work a little harder just by inspiration. And what they were looking at back then was uh, Europe that had been decimated from war, from four years of war, bombing in just cities in rubble and having to rebuild uh, 9 million people had died, 37 million people were injured and unbelievable amounts of pain. And I think they knew what the summit of Mount Everest would do for their country, yeah. just like the North Pole or the South Pole had done for those countries or 
the first person on the moon had done for this country. You know, what's the next one out there? Is there something else? Probably, mm-hmm. you know, it might be, I don't know. Mars. Yeah, it could be, or it could be an electric car that's really functional or yeah, uh, cost effective or, you know, climate change. I mean, those are moonshots similar to anyway Mm. could they have done it yeah were they motivated yeah it would be a career move to be the first to climb the highest point on earth sure that's a good move and i can't i would think that's a driver for george mallory and andrew irvine but i think at the same time being rich and famous is not a good enough motivator to to face very difficult situations, you know, rowing across the Atlantic may, you may start, I'm going to be rich and famous if I can do that. Not really. (laughs) Tons of people have done it, but you may start with some vision like that, some foggy idea that that's what's going to be your, but very soon reality steps in and it's survival. And then rich and famous doesn't matter anymore. It's, am I going to survive? And what's going to be the element that's going to keep me taking one more oar stroke or do one more difficult thing to keep this boat upright? Yeah, yeah. And so they were deep into the survival component. And for some reason, they kept going. You know, and there's probably a, you know, the cards you're dealt, you're, you're, you're holding all the cards that are keeping you taking one more step and one more breath. Wow. And they may be uh, society. They may be personal family um, and career. So do you think they did make it to wrap this all up? So you well, I think could they have. Yes, okay. I think they did. I think there was plenty of motivation to put in a long, hard day to get done with this and you know mountaineering is full of long hard days Mm. they we didn't invent 40 hour days and certainly in the war they had their share of 40 hour days yeah and that's probably you know they were just looking at a long long day so so to wrap it all up andy um not to say you'll never go back to everest but you certainly have a a breadth and wealth of experience there. What I hear when I, when I've spoken with you is immense gratitude, absolute gratitude for just waking up in the morning, being able to, as you even said, when I talked to you a year ago, being able to put one foot in front of the other and actually keep doing what you do and being alive. And to me, that's a really beautiful message. You look at the challenges and stresses most people have, and I've been able to do what I've been able to do. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, I can't explain it. And, you know, every, so I've been that lucky, you know, my, I'm, well, my responsibility is to try and pay that back to younger generations or older gen to pay that back to anybody and encourage and help and somehow for them to try and gain a portion of the incredible luck I've had somehow we're pretty damn lucky just to be able to be here and to be able to take on a challenge like everest is is a real gift and uh at 61 i'm glad i'm just glad i lived i've been there four times i've looked looked down the the barrel of the shotgun a couple of times and the best part of it is the friendships that were made along the way yeah 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 and somehow try and take the essence of what we've learned and pass it on Mm. that's you know that's probably what 
God, I don't know. It's probably what everybody's trying to do. Every old person and the young folks, you know, their responsibility is to set their perspective aside and to listen. Otherwise, they're losing that opportunity to hear what mm. this old guy is trying to say, wearing the wrong clothes, listening to the wrong music, saying it the wrong way. They have to get past that and hear what they're trying to, what message they're trying to pass on to make their lives easier. Mm. The young person, the younger generation's life easier. Andy, thank you cannot say thank you enough for the time you've taken to share with me your experience during the 1st and 16th of May, 1999. If any of you would like to, I hope you will take time to subscribe, leave me some comments, let me know what you think. And also, if you want to write me, you can reach me at tom.dharma.pollard at gmail.com. And in the box on this side of the screen is a playlist for all things about the mystery of Mallory and Irvin. And over here is a subscribe button. Choose it, pick it, click it. Thanks very much. Have a good day.